Hello everybody, this is Dan Bigman from LearnGPR.com. I am your GPR professor and I'm coming today with a video where I'm answering a question I've gotten, I think about seven times in the last two weeks. It's weird how people, people must be connecting with each other through other sorts of, you know, through brain waves, okay? We talk about waves here, radio waves on the LearnGPR, you know, channel. Um, people must have been connecting through brain waves because it's crazy how questions come about in droves. It's like nobody asks a particular question and then seven people ask a question in a matter of two weeks. This happens regularly. I don't know what the, what, what's going on in the air, but um, here's the question. The question that I keep getting lately is, can I find velocity without hyperbola fitting? Um, and maybe this is because people have watched some of our recent uh, videos about hyperbola fitting, about finding the depths of targets and things like that. And so we're constantly talking about hyperbola fitting, hyperbola fitting, hyperbola fitting. It's generally the easiest way uh, and most efficient way to develop, you know, adequate wave velocities on a site. So maybe it's all a response to that. Who knows? But nonetheless, is they want to know how can you get speeds if you can't fit the hyperbola? Uh, and there are a couple different ways that we can do this. I was going to tell you three, but really, I guess I'll say four. Um, you know, not all of them I totally recommend, but in addition to hyperbola fitting, what can you do? Um, so number one thing that you can do is you can, you can speculate, okay? You can speculate. I don't recommend this. This is the absolute last thing you should return to um, if you need to, but it is there. And what do I mean by speculate? You do some due diligence, you try to find out what the soils are like on site in this area. In the US, for example, there is a, a plugin for Google Earth created by the USGS, which gives you kind of soil content, generalized soil content from boreholes conducted by the USGS around the US, uh, around the United States. And it gives you some sort of indicator, at least when you're going into a project, what you might find. Uh, that's speculation. You might live in an area and say, yeah, I know I have clay soils. It did rain yesterday. They're probably pretty saturated. I'm going to put in saturated white clay into my GPR, and it'll give you an estimated dielectric for that. That's speculation, okay? And it might be the best thing that you have. I swear, I basically never get my speculations right. <laughs> I almost never. I always overestimate how, how much water is in there. Um... So it, it, it's something that I would caution you, you know, to, with. A lot of times I'll say, well, this is wet clay. I'm putting in 25. And then after I do a hyperbola fit, I find out that it was 16 or 12. Uh, it just wasn't very wet, you know. And so I would be careful when I, when I speculate. Number two, and I'm going to start drawing some of these in a moment. But number two, and this was the add-on last second after I started the video, is they have a... Dielectric meter. Okay, they have something called the dielectric meter. The dielectric meter basically lets you um, take soil from the ground and test it and give you, it spits out a dielectric for that soil. Okay, it spits out a dielectric for that soil, which is basically based on the, you know, uh, uh, resistance of, of the soil. My problem with this, and this is okay, again, and I know people who use it, and I don't discourage people from using this. If you have one, use it. It's usually a handheld uh, item. Problem is when you're looking at GPR data, you might be going down three meters, you might be going down six meters, you might be going down 10 meters, 30 feet below the ground surface. How do you know that what's in the first few, in, in the first foot? is going to be anything that's relevant to what's going on nine meters below the ground surface. That's my only gripe with the dielectric meter. Otherwise, it's going to give you good, accurate, I think, readings for very, very near surface. But I would be careful uh, in using this for anything that goes to any sort of depth. Okay, If you're just interested in the top you know, meter or less, then maybe this is adequate. Um, I would probably say the top foot or so, or foot and a half you know, or, or, or less, this is adequate. Anything beyond a couple feet or a meter, uh, I think you're going to start to get inconsistencies with what this tells you and what um, is actually going on. But that's number two. Number three. 
is bury something and record a hyperbola. Okay, bury something and record a hyperbola. So what do I mean? So let's say that this is your ground surface, right? That's your ground surface and you're pushing your GPR around. Okay, you're pushing it this way and you're not getting any responses and then you turn it around and you know, you go over a few feet and you push it back the other way and you're not getting any responses and you're saying, I cannot estimate what the dielectric is here. And this might be true for a lot of folks doing you know, groundwater investigations. And a number of people who got at me with this question were, were conducting groundwater studies. And they said, look, I need to know the dielectric. I'm curious about the dielectric. We're estimating groundwater water saturation. There are no hyperbola to fit it. How can I estimate it? So that, this is what they're doing. They're pushing it around, and they're just not getting any hyper, hyperbolic reflection events occurring. So what can you do? get another color. You can excavate out a very small, you know, trench or hole or whatever, okay? Put something in it at the bottom. Certainly if you can put a pipe or something like that, that's great. If you just got to dig out a hole, uh, you got to put something small in there, a rock, whatever it is, you know its depth. You know the depth. You don't even literally need the hyperbola fit, but you know the depth. And then you cover this back up, right? You fill it back in. Again, I encourage this to be as small as possible because the wider it is, the less accurate your estimates are gonna be because it's gonna take into consideration all of this uh, um, you know, trench, unconsolidated trench fill. So the smaller, the better, you know, it, it, a couple inches ideal, okay? Might not always be uh, possible. But when you do this, and then you have something buried at the bottom, go ahead and change the color for this buried object. Have something buried at the bottom, then you push this over. Now if you know, right, that this is one meter, you push this over, then in your profile, okay, and you're gonna over here have, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, five, 10, 15, 20 nanoseconds in two-way travel time. And then you're able to identify where this was. So now it does come up over here as your hyperbola. Then what you can do is say this right here equals one meter. So one meter occurs at 10 nanoseconds in two-way travel time. Just again, this is totally hypothetical and, and uh, may, may not happen, but one meter, you know, 10 nanoseconds in two-way travel time. Is that possible? It, uh, uh, let's see, 0.1 meter, which is for pretty reasonably dry soils. Okay, so point, point, 10 centimeters per nanosecond, 10 nanoseconds. This is going to not be, so let's say that this is, uh, you know, Five, okay, 10. All right, so five nanoseconds or six or seven nanoseconds, maybe a little bit more appropriate, uh, is one meter, okay? And now you know that. So now you can take this and backtrack out, well, how fast is it moving? And once you know how fast it's moving, then you can use a calculation to show you what the dielectric is, okay? And the calculation is, it's C prime equals C over, uh, um, square root of K. So that means that it's the speed of this material equals the speed of the radio wave in air over the square root of the dielectric. So you can back that out yourself uh, or join us at learngpr.com's uh, GPR Academy and we'll do all that for you. Uh, but that's how you would do it. Very something. So you can get a reflection. Know how long it took for the two-way travel time, estimate what the speed is, and then backtrack that speed out to get your dielectric. That's the way that you would do it. The final way, so there, I told you there was gonna be four. Okay, so here's the final way to do it. All right, so way number four 
I'm just giving you the ultra, ultra, super value today, okay? Number four is you can use a common midpoint offset. Common midpoint offset, often referred to as a CMP, okay, a CMP. How does a CMP work? A CMP works like this. You don't have any hyperbola, right? And you don't have a hyperbola because you don't have something that's reasonably round, that's buried within the space that you're looking at, right? Within the depth that you're looking. <clears throat> so here, right? Ground surface is right here. And let's say that this has, you know, a couple layers in there, All right? So here's, here's a layer, and let's say that here's another layer, right? So this is the geological layers, okay? So you got multiple layers in there. All right? Multiple layers, okay? How do you get, and you can't bury anything, how do you estimate the wave velocity or the dielectric permittivity in this situation? You can use a common midpoint offset. And what that does is it basically constructs a half a hyperbola for you. All right? So what you need is two antenna, separate antenna. You need a transmitter and a receiver, okay? Transmitter and receiver. And you, you know, these may be, you know, one meter apart, okay? One meter. Comes down, hits off this, and that gives you your trace. The way it builds it will be like this. Okay, so how's it gonna build it? Now here's what your actual data will look like as you do, as you go through this process, okay? Okay, one meter. It's gonna give you the direct wave, it's gonna give you the ground wave, it's gonna give you this, right? So you'll get, okay, no, I'm, I'm still going ahead of myself. Okay, so you get the, right, you get the direct wave, you get the ground wave, and then you'll get uh, your first hit, right? You'll get the hit off of this. Okay? And then you'll, you'll also get the hit right off of this, Okay, so you get another one down here. Now what happens? You move them apart. Right, transmitter and receiver, and they're now two meters apart, two meters apart. And you do the same exact process, okay? Same exact process. So two meters apart, you're getting a hit. It takes a little bit longer for the direct wave, a little bit longer for the air wave, and then maybe a little bit longer for the purple response and then for the green. What do you do next? You get the picture. You go out to three meters. Okay? Transmitter, receiver. You with me? Transmitter, receiver. And now you're three meters apart. And the whole thing goes over again. So now what happens? It takes a little longer for the direct wave, a little bit longer for the ground wave, maybe quite a bit longer, right, for the purple, and maybe quite a bit longer for the green. One more time. And now we're looking at four meters, right? Same. And that's your CMP. Why do I show you this? Well, let's connect the dots. There was, a, there was a show back in the day when I was growing up and they used to do connect the dots. La, 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 connect the dots, okay? Connect the dots, 
La 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 la. So, now we've connected the dots. Well, what does this look like right here? What does that look like to you? It should look like a half a hyperbola. That's what it should look like, a half a hyperbola. What can you do with a half a hyperbola? You can fit it. So if you don't have a hyperbola to fit, using a CMP, you create a hyperbola to fit. You create a half a hyperbola. This is how the CMP data is generated. Create a half a hyperbola. Then you can come in. You can fit the hyperbola, half a hyperbola in your post-processing software. Now you say, uh-huh. I go ahead and fit it based on that geometry, the way it has to be moving at X speed, which means, again, using the formula I put up before, it has to be Y dielectric. Using X speed has to be Y dielectric. I fit this half a hyperbola or this one, okay, it doesn't matter. Fit them, got them moving at X speed, which means it has to be Y dielectric, right? Um, that's how you do it. That's the fourth way. What do you do if you don't have a hyperbola? You either speculate, you get a dielectric meter, you bury something and record a hyperbola, or, or it doesn't even have to be a hyperbola, you just record a response, and then you can backtrack that response to the known depth, or you use a common midpoint offset, which allows you to create a half a hyperbola based on that process, and allows you to fit that half a hyperbola then. So, I hope this was helpful. Uh, if you didn't know any of these in the comments below, tell me one that you never thought of before. Uh, I learned from all of you just like you learned from me. So I'd love to hear what your experiences have been and how you've dealt with these kinds of problems uh, in the past if you've never had a hyperbola to fit. Um, if you like the video, please share it around. If you know somebody who can use it, share it around. Subscribe to our channel. Please subscribe to our channel. It would mean a lot to me. I'm trying to build the community here. And hop over to learngpr.com, put your name and email address in. Uh, you'll get access to our introductory uh, uh, web training video, and, and we will send you videos like this to your inbox every single week. I appreciate you watching. I hope you got something out of it, and I wish you nothing but the best.